You are listening to a pre-recorded podcast of the Paul Shabari Show with me, Paul Shabari, every Thursday from noon to two on SportstownChicago.com. Well, you know what time it is now. Usually I like to wrap up my show talking to Gabe Salgado. He's my regular guy. We talk about all sorts of things, college hoops. Uh, we've been following Cleveland Melvin this year, Michael Sam and Jason Collins and kind of those storylines. Uh, this week we're going to definitely talk about Cleveland Melvin because there's some big news on his front as he's going to be joining the NBA Developmental League. And, uh, of course, as the college hoop season wraps up here in Chicagoland, we're going to be touching on that. And we'll get to the Northwestern Wildcats uh, football pro day that uh, just recently happened that Gabe went and covered. But, uh, Gabe, first of all, welcome back to the show. Hi, Paul. How's it going? It's going all right. Uh, you know, kind of... Uh, Touching upon the Devin Hester story uh, today, I think that's kind of a uh, big news as uh, a lot of people are going to be missing him as he uh, takes his career elsewhere outside of the city of Chicago. I uh, want to get your th- quick thoughts on that before we kind of dive into the rest of the stuff here. Uh, your thoughts on uh, Devin Hester no longer being with the Bears. This is clearly a salary cap move by the Bears. You know, the type of money that Hester was looking for to stay, what kind of put the Bears in a little bit of a crunch considering if they're trying to rebuild their defense. So this is purely a salary cap decision. I know that a lot of Bears fans are probably upset, and that's understandable. But, you know, unfortunately, the NFL works like that sometimes. And this is clearly a salary cap move. And now the question uh, that needs to be answered is what's going to happen with Julius Peppers. Um, Off the top of your head, what was your favorite Devin Hester moment with the Bears? It definitely has to be that uh, opening kick return in the Super Bowl a few years back. Yeah, that that seems to be everyone's number one choice here. There's way like way too many uh, returns though that were so memorable. But uh, let's dive into this. Uh, we were following Cleveland Melvin's career uh, a little bit here at DePaul and kind of talking about this season how he was uh, really the team leader this year and really improved his game a lot this year, uh, becoming an, an an outside shooting threat. Uh, but then uh, he has an ap- academic situation. He's uh, off the team, out of the school, and now he's in the uh, NBA D League. And uh, it was Erie that picked him up. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on uh, Melvin starting his professional career. And, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about how he does have a shot at making the NBA. But uh, this seems kind of an atypical sort of storyline for a player uh, leaving his senior year of college and immediately going into the developmental league or playing professionally. Um, can you name any other players that have, that have really done this sort of uh, this move before? Well, you know, it doesn't, ha- doesn't happen often. And, you know, we did talk about a few weeks back, you know, what wouldn't, you know, Cleveland Melvin's next move be. We definitely said that this would be one of them. Uh, keep in mind, he's still eligible for the NBA draft, so there's a very good chance that he can still get drafted in June. But if he doesn't, at least, you know, it's a start. You know, he, they put the claim on him. And, you know, you know, if he ends up signing with the team, it's definitely a start, and it's definitely something for him to, to move on with his career. Um, you know, uh, even though I know you had said that there could have been academic reasons that happened at DePaul, I haven't heard anything. They've been really tight-lipped on why he left, and I don't think we'll ever really know. But, um, you know, uh, you know, Cleveland Melvin, obviously, you know, it's good to see that he was able to, you know, get an opportunity now. It's just a matter of whether or not he stays in the D-League or if he can end up in the NBA in June. I guess, yeah, you're right. It was, it's not necessarily an academic thing. Uh, Tony Gennetti from the Sun-Times is saying it's an undisclosed conduct uh, violation. Um, but do you think this helps or hurts uh, Cleveland Melvin's chances of uh, make, of being drafted, uh, playing in the, the D-League uh, this March instead of playing uh, in the Big East tournament this March? You know, that's really a tough call, only because of the fact that, you know, he – there's still, you know, there's still maybe a chance that an NBA team could try to give him a shot, you know, so it can go either way. But, you know, like I said, you know, it's definitely a starting block for him, you know, so it's just a matter of to see how it progresses from here. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, it's he's definitely someone whose career I definitely am curious to watch now with him already being uh, kind of a professional and still having a shot at the the NBA draft this summer. Um, it's It seems like he's made a lot of changes to his game that really would make him uh, definitely someone that could fill up a roster spot, definitely in the NBA for, for a couple of years to come here. Uh, but let's transition out of that, get into the local Chicago Hoops uh, uh, stories here before we get to Northwestern. Uh, UIC, their season's over. They go 1-15 in the, the Horizon League. Um, is Howard Moore's job on the line right now? I mean, is he in the hot seat right now since it was such a disappointing year for the Flames? I don't think so just yet. You know, the, you know, the thing with UIC is that, you know, the talent pool – this year completely changed from last year, and they just didn't have 
you know, the same group of talent, and, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of depth either. So, you know, hopefully they'll give Howard Moore a chance to rebuild the talent and, you know, recruit and bring some guys to fill some positions where there were some voids. So I don't think he's on the hot seat just yet, but hopefully they can turn it around next season. And uh, speaking of coaches at Northwestern, uh, you know, they still have a couple more games on the schedule here before they start Big Ten tournament play. Kind of a given that they're probably not going to make the NCAA tournament because they would have to win out at the in the tournament. Uh, but Chris Collins' first year is wrapping up. It looks like he's going to finish about the same as Bill Carmody had the the Cats uh, finishing last year. Do you think this season was an improvement over Bill Carmody, or do you think that it was kind of uh, kind of a little bit of the same thing as we saw last year? There was definitely an improvement on the defensive side of the ball. Offense, you know, they were still kind of stagnant, but that was because, you know, they didn't really have the type of talent that you needed, and they weren't getting production from a lot of guys. But they definitely improved on the defensive side of the ball. You know, hopefully with the new recruiting class they're bringing in next year, they can get better offensively. Um, but it's definitely a start. It is a step in the right direction, and hopefully Northwestern can build on that. And uh, Loyola starts their first ever Missouri Valley tournament uh i keep wanting to say the horizon league but it's definitely missouri valley tournament uh first game is uh tonight against bradley uh the uh loyola ramblers uh one in 15 at on the road and then neutral court games this season not really a good record not really a strong stat going into tonight's game uh is there a chance that we could see a victory tonight and do you think uh loyola could play spoiler to a lot of teams here in the missouri valley it's going to be very tough for them to get past Bradley. Bradley's already beaten them twice this year. Uh, you know, North, you know, Loyola struggled away from the Gentile Center. Although this is technically a neutral site game, they still had to travel, and uh, it's going to be very difficult. You know, they can they keep the turnovers down? Can they sustain the second half lead? Can the offense score some points? There's a lot of question marks going into tonight's game that you know will decide whether or not Northwestern advances. To the, I mean, excuse me, Loyola advances to the next round. And then uh, Chicago State looks to be pretty much the only hope that uh, that we all have left here in the city to maybe do some damage in, in March and maybe make it into the tournament. Um, any confidence there that Chicago State can uh, make some waves in the Western Athletic Conference tournament? Well, you know, they've proved that they can hold their own during the regular season. You know, I know that overall they have, I think they're at 500, maybe a game or two below, but that was because of a lot of non-conference losses. But if they can uh, make some noise in the uh, – WAC tournament, maybe they can get in to one of the smaller postseason tournaments like they did last year, but they definitely have a chance. You know, they've improved, you know, talent-wise. Uh, they've improved on both sides of the ball, and, you know, Tracy Dilby's definitely got his players buying into his system. That's uh, Gabe Salgado that we're talking to right now. He's a freelance writer. You can follow him at Gabe Salgado 82 uh, Gabe, with all these uh, Chicago basketball teams in action tonight, which game are you going to be keeping an eye on, or are you covering any of these games tonight? Well, I'll be at the DePaul Butler game tonight. You know, DePaul's going to have senior night. DePaul's already beaten Butler this year, so can they end the season on a winning note? You know, can they win their last home game? And maybe, you know, if they can pull off a victory, maybe they can help Oliver Purnell hang on to his job for a little while longer. So, you know, hopefully the Blue Demons can pull one out and end the season on the on a positive note. And if uh, if DePaul loses tonight and maybe their first game in the Big East tournament, is that the last we see of Oliver Purnell coaching on the sidelines? It's definitely going to come up. You know, it'll definitely put him on the hot seat. You know, he's had a losing record since he's been here. You know, other places that he's coached, it was always year three when he turns the team around, but that just hasn't happened here at DePaul. You know, I, you know whether whether it's you know he's recruiting the wrong players or whether it's he can't get the players that he brings in to buy into a system. It's been very difficult to say the least. And, you know, it, it's taken a once proud program down tremendously. And, you know, I can only imagine what Ray Meyer would think if he was still alive. It's definitely been a rough go. And if DePaul can't pull out a couple of victories here to end the season, I definitely think there should be a, a reevaluation of his job. Um, and, and let's, let's talk about uh, Northwestern football here. You covered uh, their pro day and this is um, kind of a, it was kind of a disappointing year for the Northwestern Wildcats. Uh, came off uh, last season winning their first uh, bowl game in over 50 years, and then followed that up this year uh, being a strong contender for the Big Ten, but kind of just fell off the table after that that tough loss at home to Ohio State. Um, this is a program that doesn't produce too many NFL players, but definitely has 
uh, history of of producing NFL caliber players, and including uh, some right now that are making impacts on their teams. Uh, Nick Roach comes to mind. Corey Wooten locally for us. Um, what what players out of out of all the guys that had their pro day with uh, Northwestern this week, who do you think is the most likely to make an impact in the NFL? You know, honestly, even though he wasn't able to participate because he's still healing from an injury, I'd have to say Kane Coulter. You know, you take a look at the rest of the guys that uh, participated, uh, Rashard Lawrence and uh, Mike Jensen, the wide receivers, even when they had some speed, they're definitely undersized for the NFL. Uh, Tyler Scott, defensive lineman, he's definitely smaller than most defensive linemen entering the draft. Linebacker Damian Proby, you know, he's he's having the same issue. And then defensive tackle Will Hampton, he pulled his quad muscle, you know, right off the bat running the 40-yard dash, and he wasn't able to continue. So, you know, there's questions as to, you know, whether or not he was training properly, whether or not he was staying in shape. And, you know, uh, Jeff Budzine probably can, you know, land somewhere because, you know, he's definitely got the leg for it. But, you know, kicking – you know, the kicker position is a position of longevity in the NFL. So, you know, it'll be hard for him to get on a team unless they really need a kicker. But it looks like uh, Kane Coulter and probably Jeff Budzin have the best chance to get somewhere in the draft. Now, with Kane Coulter uh, playing quarterback for the Wildcats, do you, you were saying in your article uh, that you wrote recently that uh, he could be a wide receiver in the NFL. Um, how much talk of, of that is there? And, uh Kind of just sizing him up, uh, scouting him. Do you think he he would be better at wide receiver, and do you think he could be a good NFL wide receiver? Well, that's what they're looking at him as. Uh, when he was invited to the combine, they invited him as a wide receiver, but again, he wasn't able to participate. You know, he at the Senior Bowl before he re-injured his ankle, he was working out as a receiver. Uh, even though he did play quarterback, you know, you know the height thing is an issue. You know, he, you know, he's shorter than most quarterbacks, and while he does have the accuracy, he doesn't necessarily have the arm strength, but he definitely has the speed, he definitely has mobility, and he, he's shown he can run routes at Northwestern, so he'll, he's definitely being looked at as a wide receiver. I think he could definitely be a good slot receiver and probably a kick returner as well. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe make a comparison for me, Kane Coulter versus Jordan Lynch, in terms of uh, what each player maybe brings to the table. Um, you know, we all know about Lynch's speed, and and he's kind of another local uh, quarterback from Northern Illinois that uh, will probably not be a quarterback in the NFL um, if he even makes it there. Uh, but I was wondering if you can kind of compare Kane Coulter's game to Jordan Lynch's and the similarities and differences between the two. Well, Jordan Lynch definitely has a stronger arm than Kane Coulter and may not necessarily be the most accurate, but I think Jordan Lynch has the, has the ability or has a better chance, I should say, to play quarterback in the NFL. Uh, the issue with Jordan Lynch, it's not that, you know, he can't throw. It's what it is is that, you know, whenever he was put in situations where he had to throw the ball more often than not, when he had to throw the ball 30, 40 times a game, you know, he, he, he he threw a lot of incomplete passes. That's because you know he felt rushed. You know you know the most situations Northern Illinois was behind. You know he was rushing his throws to try to get the ball downfield. Didn't really have a whole lot of patience. So that was the the main issue that hurt him. But I think Jordan Lynch has a better chance of playing quarterback in the NFL than Kent Coulter does. And I wanted to bring up uh, Jimmy Garoppolo because uh, he's another another uh, downstate quarterback, uh, and he's getting a lot of looks by the uh, the scouts here. I wanted to maybe talk about where he's going to end up in the NFL draft, and uh, maybe why he wasn't uh, so much of a, a really talked about guy. I know he goes to Eastern Illinois, which isn't really the most scouted school, but this is also a school that produced Tony Romo at quarterback. Uh, maybe talk about Jimmy Garoppolo and uh, where he's going to end up, and why he wasn't really noticed too much uh, around the league. Well, you know, he's uh, he's definitely, his draft stock has gone up. You know, he's got the arm strength. He's got the accuracy. You know, he's your uh, prototypical modern-day uh, pocket passer quarterback. He has a little bit of mobility on him. You know, he uh, he had all 32 scouts looking at him. He held a private workout for Jim Harbaugh recently. And, um, you know, he's definitely going to be one of the first quarterbacks taken without a doubt. You know, um, I think he has the ability to prove that, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to a big school to succeed in the NFL. You know, uh, uh, he definitely, you know, he worked his butt off. And, you know, he brought the scouts and the general managers to him because of his ability to throw the ball. So uh, he'll definitely be one of the first quarterbacks taken. As for where he'll, where he'll end up, that I can't say. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him in a Bears uniform, you know, being back of the Jay Cutler, you know, learning from, you know, Jay Cutler as a veteran. 
But uh, it's tough to say where he'll end up at this point because there are a few teams that could use a, a good, strong arm quarterback. And uh, while we're talking about the Bears and drafting, uh, what do you anticipate the Bears will do with their, their first-round draft pick this year? They're either going to go defensive line or safety. Those are their biggest positions of need. Uh, defensive line is the bigger need, but they're going to go either defensive line or uh, safety on, on with their first-round pick. Do you think it's likely that it's just going to be either Tommy Jernigan or Haha ha Clinton Dix, or is there someone else uh, in the mix here that we're missing, aside from maybe like Lewis Nix or uh, I'm trying to think the uh, the player from Louisville that plays safety that's uh, slotted above uh, uh, Clinton Dix right now? Uh, your thoughts on uh, on if there's a particular player they should be looking at? You know, they have a handful of guys that they're looking at. Clinton Dix is one of them. Lewis Nix, Stephen Tewitt, um, Aaron Donald, the D-tackle from uh, Pittsburgh. So they got a few guys that they're looking at. It's just a matter of who's still going to be available by the time that they pick and, you know, who they feel is going to be uh, the strongest asset to the team and that's going to help them win down the road. Uh, before I let you go, Gabe, uh, you said tonight you're going to be covering the DePaul Blue Demons' uh, final regular season game against Butler tonight. Um, I'd imagine that you know we're going to see an article uh, recap of it uh, tomorrow. Uh, what else do you got for us this week? Uh, what, what are some of the stories that you're going to be following this week? I'll also be covering Chicago State's final home game on Saturday, and uh, you know hopefully they can end on a winning note and have some momentum heading into the WAC tournament next week. All right. Uh, thank you, Gabe. Uh, as always, thanks for coming on the show and uh, sharing your thoughts about all this. And uh, it should get interesting here in the next few weeks as we start, you know, getting close to the NFL draft and what the Bears are going to do. And I look forward to, to your thoughts on scouting some of these future NFL players. All right. Thank you, Paul. That's uh, Gabe Salgado. He is a freelance writer. You can follow him on Twitter at Gabe Salgado 82. Uh, always gives me great stuff. Um, just Brilliant guy, and uh, I like that we can talk about a, a lot of different topics. Uh, he, he's a guest on my show every week, so if you uh, if you are a fan of the Paul Savari show, or maybe it's your first time uh, listening here, you can definitely expect me to talk with Gabe Salgado, and uh, we keep it local. I like that. I mean, we do some national stuff, but we really have a local slant on things, so always great to uh, to hear from Gabe Salgado. 